Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining this workshop entitled, How Are Medicaid Programs in Southern States Potentially Advancing Maternal Health Equity and What More Could They Do? So my name is Leandra Lacey. I'm a training and technical assistant specialist with the Urban Institute in Washington, DC. And for those who aren't familiar with Urban, it is a nonprofit research organization that provides data and evidence to help advance upward mobility and equity. I am thrilled to be joined today by Amy Ladley, the State Perinatal Quality Program Manager at the Louisiana Department of Health, and Kai Lindbergh, who is the Executive Director of Healthy Mothers, Healthy Babies, Coalition of Georgia. So um, today I'll be discussing research conducted by Urban, and then we'll hear from Amy and Kai about their perspective on Medicaid programs in their state, potentially advancing maternal health. Um, Amy and Kai happen to be two of the interviewees for this research study, so I'm so happy they could join today. I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues on the research team, Jennifer Haley, uh, Sophia Hinojosa, and Carla Willis, and the research is funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation with input from the RWFJ Community Advisory board. Um, and before we dive in, I'd like to know that the forthcoming research report, it should be released in September, from Urban, uses the term women and mothers in line with the Social Security Act. But we do recognize that all people who get pregnant and use pregnancy and other maternal care do not necessarily identify as such. So before I provide more information about the research, I'd like to set the stage. So there is a maternal morbidity and mortality crisis, as many of you know, um, especially among Black and other birthing people of color. In 2020, Black women were about three times more likely than white women to die of pregnancy-related causes. There has been increased attention to this crisis as seen through the blueprint for addressing the maternal health crisis by the White House recently. There was a documentary released last month called Aftershock about a couple of young Black women who died after giving birth. And there has been more and more research about maternal health inequities, especially with the COVID pandemic exacerbating poor outcomes. So abortion restrictions are likely to further exacerbate maternal mortality in the U.S. Um, since the Supreme Court overruled Roe v. Wade in June, many states have enforced trigger laws that put them in the hostile or illegal category when it comes to abortion restrictions, according to the Center for Reproductive Rights, um, where this map on the screen comes from. This is unfortunate, of course, um, when states with trigger laws or existing bans um, are often already have high morta maternal mortality. Um, so not only does this issue impact maternal mortality though, research suggests that the ruling poses a disproportionate threat to the economic mobility of low income women of color in particular. So why the focus on Medicaid, you may ask, for this research study? So there are generous income and immigration rules for pregnancy-related Medicaid and the Children's Health Insurance Program, or CHIP. You'll hear me refer to it as CHIP coverage. Um, so though these rules still leave eligibility gaps for undocumented non-citizens, some documented non-citizens, and those who do not meet the income requirements, the median income eligibility level for pregnancy-related Medicaid and CHIP is around 200% of the federal, federal poverty level and half of states covering legally present immigrant women without a waiting period. So on the other hand, um, the median Medicaid threshold for non-pregnant adults is 138% of the FPL in states who've adopted the Affordable Care Act's uh, Medicaid expansion. So um, pregnancy-related Medicaid and CHIP is also comprehensive in nearly every state with low cost sharing. Um, this coverage expires 60 days after the end of a pregnancy, but this was temporarily extended during the current public health emergency. Um, and states have the option to extend beyond 60 days via an 1115 waiver um, or through a state plan amendment under the American Rescue Plan Act. And I'll talk a little bit about that later too. 
So um, with more than four in 10 of all births nationally, 65% um, of births among Black women and 59% of births among Hispanic women covered by Medicaid, uh, Medicaid policies and practices have the potential to improve maternal health and reduce racial and ethnic inequities. So this graph is actually from the Kaiser Family Foundation. It's from 2018, so um, it includes older data, um, so it's different than the one I mentioned, but wanted to provide a visual here to show the share of births by pair and maternal race and ethnicity. So eight of the 12 states that have not adopted Medicaid expansion are located in the South, as you can see from this visual, also by the Kaiser Family Foundation. This leaves many low-income Southern women and other birthing people with limited access to affordable health coverage outside of pregnancy. So now that I've set the stage a bit, um, I'll share more about the research study out of Urban. So in late 2021 to early 2022, the Urban team conducted five interviews with national experts on maternal health, asking about their perspectives on the topic, including which Southern states they saw as promising examples of advancing maternal health equity in Medicaid, despite political barriers and any other constraints. And from these, we selected three study states, Georgia, Louisiana, and Texas, for further research based on their suggestions, and we wanted to include both Medicaid expansion and non-expansion states. So uh, this year, we conducted 12 interviews with stakeholders in these particular states. So we spoke with state officials who work in Medicaid agency in all three study states and Medicaid managed care organizations or MCOs in two of the states. We also spoke with maternal health stakeholders in all three states, including representatives of community-based organizations, advocacy organizations, maternal mortality review committees, maternal health consortiums, and researchers. So as you can see, a broad array of stakeholders. Our main research questions explore the extent to which equity drives initiatives, the facilitators and barriers to advance efforts, including any kind of federal support needed, the use of data to advance equity, and the extent to which efforts are being assessed and evaluated. We also probed on legislative and non-legislative approaches to advancing maternal health and levers that Medicaid programs can exercise to potentially improve maternal health. And as I mentioned, this report uh, should be released sometime next month, so very happy to share it with you all once it's out. So now I'll dive more into our main findings. As previously mentioned, the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021 gives states the option to extend pregnancy-related Medicaid and CHIP coverage from 60 days to 12 months postpartum starting April 1st, 2022, for five years um, using a state plan amendment or SPA or 1115 waivers. So there are a growing number of states that have implemented this extension, um, actually 23 states plus the District of Columbia as of July 28th. So some really recent data there for you. And there are 11 others that are planning to implement an extension, as you can see from this visual, again, by Kaiser Family Foundation. They have a lot of great information in this area. Listed here are barriers that interviewees cited as um, just obstacles to advancing maternal health where they are. Um, I'd like to be clear that these barriers don't necessarily apply to every case study state or even every state in the South or nationally. This is just a snapshot from the perspectives we gathered during the interviews. So one, um, political sensitivities were viewed as an obstacle to progress on advancing maternal health in Medicaid in some Southern states. Um, so stakeholders reported pressure not to frame policies as addressing racial and ethnic inequities. Um, one stakeholder even said or described um, maternal health equity is still a relatively taboo conversation outside of the public health and clinical space. The legislator is slowly but grudgingly slowly starting to recognize the inequities. 
So just wanted to pull in that kind of real life perspective from one of our stakeholders. Um, some stakeholders also described a lack of willingness to support state policies, advancing equity with a preference for the word disparity. So two, um, key informants mentioned a lack of awareness or interest among legislators, some legislators, in incorporating non-traditional providers. So doulas actually came up as a specific tool that has a lack of awareness or interest in some places, despite the research suggesting that doula-supported births often result in fewer complications. This suggests that where there is lack of awareness or interest in doula care or other non-traditional providers or tools, that legislators may not understand the value of reimbursing such providers in Medicaid, for instance, without further awareness. Three, some Southern stakeholders highlighted a lack of quality data on racial ethnic disparities and limited plans for evaluation. This is very important and honestly something that the research team wrestled with a bit. We cannot truly say an initiative is advancing equity, right, if there isn't high quality and timely data. So this is why you'll hear me say something like may potentially advance maternal health or equity, since I, we can't say for sure without that data and evaluation. And lastly, some informants also refer to variation in access to providers and healthcare services within areas of a state, such as for rural or urban areas. Resources may be limited in some regions of a large state while concentrated in other regions. A Medicaid enrollee may not know where to seek maternal health services, or the services may be absent altogether if the member is living in a maternal health desert. And this issue can be exacerbated by a lack of coordination across stakeholders within the state. I won't read all of this because I know there is a lot of information here, but I wanted to also highlight some strategies that rose to the top during interviews that may combat the barriers I previously mentioned and help generate support for policies and programs to potentially advance maternal health. Um, I'd like to focus first on number two about broadening the framing of disparities. So for some policymakers, uh, policies potential to narrow racial or ethnic disparities helps gain support. But for others, emphasizing the potential for narrowing gaps for other populations, such as rural or low-income populations, can be a bit more effective for generating political support as opposed to using the word equity. I think this ties well into number three listed here on your screen. Um, considering approaches that are most salient to the specific group of policymakers that you want to target. So uh, this came up as stakeholders mentioned, considering whether policymakers would be more open to cost-based reasoning or emotional-based reasoning. So of course, there could be other reasons, but those rose to the top in our interviews. And lastly, I'd like to focus on number seven, um, because I found it very encouraging. Uh, one stakeholder said that incremental progress is still progress, meaning that sometimes a smaller policy goal, such as shorter postpartum extension, for instance, can set the stage for more comprehensive policy change, such as a full 12 months of postpartum coverage. According to our interviewees, um, shifting framing to tackle political and other barriers is just not sufficient for broad transformation in maternal health equity and Southern Medicaid programs. So a broad set of stakeholders than just the Medicaid agency and state legislator is really needed and collaboration among these stakeholders is also needed. So stakeholders, um, or I keep saying stakeholders, our interviewees, just so I don't have to keep saying stakeholders, um, interviewees described many types of organizations that can assist Medicaid programs with building support for equity-focused initiatives. So partners can bring in neutral, trusted information or work directly to build consensus. Um, however, uh, potential partners were often described as not sufficiently integrated with Medicaid to fulfill their potential impact. And there was variation across types of organizations as far as some having a stronger direct focus on racial and ethnic equity than others. 
So partners mentioned um, are included here on your screen. Those are some examples. There are quite a few, but there are also others that aren't listed here, such as individual providers, community members, academia, philanthropy, and researchers. State level interviewees um, also discuss federal policy actions that could support efforts to advance maternal health within Southern Medicaid programs and more broadly, um, which the research team divided into four major topic areas, as you can see here. Um, they shared existing federal policies that should be enforced or provided modifications to federal policies to strengthen them and or provide a stronger racial ethnic focus. Um, so this on your screen is not meant to be an exhaustive list. I just wanted to pull out some examples from our draft report, um, but eligibility coverage and services included strengthening support for adopting currently optional policy changes. Um, expanding the perinatal workforce was also very important, especially when it comes to encouraging racial, linguistic, and cultural concordance between providers and the communities they serve. Um, Patient-centered care came up, um, like enforcing patient rights to language translation, that is very key, and data and oversight are also important. I can't say enough how much that data piece is so significant to know if equity is actually being advanced. Um, our interviewees also describe additional policy tools that state Medicaid programs can potentially leverage. Again, we divided them into large buckets, um, including the four that were on the previous screen, but here are three others that we use for this particular section. Um, MCO contracting, for instance, um, potentially tying increased provider reimbursement rates to performance on equity measures came up as an example, um, leveraging existing federal avenues, such as taking advantage of federal options that capitalize on legislators' interest in improving maternal health care, again, like through targeted 1115 waivers or through the American Rescue Plan Act postpartum extension. Another bucket was the care delivery transformation. So mandating training, for instance, in linguistically and culturally competent care for all clinicians and support staff to reduce bias um, and not necessarily limiting this to Medicaid providers for that better buy in. And we wanted to be sure we included that all clinicians and other support staff, because we know that patients don't necessarily just interact with their um, provider. They may be interacting with front uh, front desk set staff or nurses or other people. So we wanted to be sure to include that. So um, in conclusion, I wanted to leave you with this excerpt from the report. Again, that should be coming out. It says um, late August, early September. It'll likely be in that early September range. Um, broad, sustained, multi-sector action using a variety of Medicaid policies or being intentionally redundant as described by one stakeholder along with evaluation of the effectiveness of such efforts is urgently needed to improve outcomes and reduce longstanding inequities. I thought that was perfect um, because obviously it's the one a, a part of the conclusion for the paper, but it just sums up everything really well. It hits on that multi-sector uh, action. It talks about that quote from our stakeholder being intentionally <laughs> redundant um, and also that focus on evaluation of efforts is so, so key. And some Something that's lacking a bit when it comes to knowing if these initiatives are advancing equity. So thank you so much um, for your time and I will pass it on over to Amy for her presentation. Thanks so much Leandra. I'm really grateful um, for you kind of setting the stage for this conversation um, and I'm excited <coughs> to talk to you about Louisiana today. Um, next slide please. Uh, so I just four goals real quick as we're navigating uh, today. I'm going to talk about sort of current and future efforts relative to Medi Louisiana Medicaid work, um, you know, not and, and also challenges for Louisiana Medicaid. And then I'm going to talk a little bit specifically about some programmatic work being done within the Louisiana Perinatal Quality Collaborative sort of as an extension or an agent of maternal health equity and disparities reduction work. Uh, in Louisiana, sort of as an agent of change and alignment within um, with Ms. Louisiana Medicaid. Um, next slide, please. And I like to preface this by saying I don't work for Louisiana Medicaid. So I will, if you like, pepper 
um, the chat or the Q&A with uh, amazing questions. I will do my best and then I will um, filter them to the appropriate uh, Medicaid geniuses <laughs> to answer. So uh, we were the first state to expand postpartum coverage to 12 months under the American Rescue Plan, which we Andrew so amazingly outlined and it's something we're really proud of. So we still get to really understand how that affects sort of, um, you know, Louisiana families and we're still trying to understand that. Um, other things we have going on related to improving maternal care, maternal equity. We have an in lieu of service option for doula support that's currently on the books. Um, we have also stood up in the last few months a doula registry board through the um, Bureau of Family Health within the Louisiana Department of Health to sort of help facilitate and structure um, our understanding of, of doulas and um, to help encourage uh, engagement uh, with the doula um, with that in lieu of service option on the part of MCOs. And we have lots of hopes for expansion of that uh, of, of that service option from kind of an in lieu of service option to something maybe a little bit more official. We also have an in lieu of service option for care coordination of birth parents affected by substance use disorder. I know one MCO who's currently um, taking advantage of this in lieu of service option and has a really exceptional care coordination program in place um, with the hopes that that will be expanded to others as well. And kind of looking ahead, Louisiana Medicaid is also um, actively working on an outpatient lactation policy to support um, coverage for outpatient lactation supporters, which is huge in reducing disparities, um, particularly for um, black and brown birthing persons. Um, we have really profound disparities related to breastfeeding um, in Louisiana and also remote patient monitoring um, uh, also in Louisiana as well. So those are two areas where we're really hoping um, to, to move the needle in terms of future Medicaid coverage. Next slide. The sticky wicket is that that Medicaid is kind of a clunky agent of change, you know, um, in a state like Louisiana, um, where the institutional and structural and systemic drivers of disparity are incredibly complex and incredibly ingrained, um, Medicaid can't serve as a panacea, right? It can't serve as a fix all to this really um, immensely complex uh, system that contributes to health disparities, that contributes to maternal mortality and morbidity, um, and that contributes to uh, health inequities. Um, and so we can't rely on Medicaid exclusively as like a sole agent of change in that regard. Um, but Medicaid is doing quite a bit, right, to sort of uh, do what they can within that structure. And one thing, um, and Leandra mentioned this, so I love sort of, I love a good, I love a good tee up. So thanks, Leandra, um, is that uh, in this current MCO cycle, uh, Medicaid, Louisiana Medicaid did sort of leverage the current MCO contracts to, um, you know, sort of enhance equity work through the provision of value added benefit sort of in the current um, MCO contract cycle. So you'll kind of see that in the current MCO uh, contracts or that enhanced or added equity element. Um, also really a robust Louisiana Medicaid quality improvement um, arm, which is a really exceptional and wonderful group of people that work together, but also really leveraging partnerships outside of Louisiana Medicaid to try to serve as agents of change um, to help address some of those social um, drivers and determinants of health. And that's kind of where I come in with my work. So next slide. Now we get into talking about stuff where I'm a little bit more of an expert. So this is where my work lives. I'm with the Delisiana Department of Health, like Medicaid, but more specifically, I'm in the Office of Public Health in the Bureau of Family Health, which for those of you who are uh, Department of Health uh, nerds out there, we are the Title V or Maternal Child Health Block Grant kind of home within the Louisiana Department of Health. And the work of um, my particular area is overseen um, also by a legislatively created and governor appointed commission um, that oversees activities related to infant and maternal mortality. Next slide. So I manage the Louisiana Perinatal Quality Collaborative and 
our mission is really about promoting safe, equitable, and dignified birth in Louisiana. It's just that simple, right? We want all birthing persons and infants to benefit from deliveries that are safe, right, and evidence-based, equitable, and, and dignity, dignified, right? Um, at present, 47 of the state's 48 birthing hospitals participate in at least one initiative, which is super duper exciting. Um, we're hoping to get that last one on board. I want them, they will be mine. Um, and we have been implementing in bundles since 2018, um, which is as long as we have been in, <laughs> in existence. So if you are an AIM bundle, you've been keeping track of AIM bundles, we are doing four of them at present and we are hoping to bring two to three more on board uh, in the next year and a half to two years or so. Next slide, please. This is just a brief overview of what we're currently working on, our current four initiatives. The GIFT is a statewide breastfeeding and infant nutrition initiative, and it has a quality improvement designation attached. The Safe Births Initiative is really focused on close, more closely on drivers of maternal mortality and morbidity, AIM bundle implementation, and it has a quality improvement designation attached. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, our ISED initiative or improving care for the substance exposed dyad initiative, um, which focuses obviously on improving care for the substance exposed dyad. I'm also gonna talk a little bit more about that in a second. And our newest um, pilot, which is focused on caregiver depression screening in pediatrics. Next slide. So early on in this work, and we've been in existence for, for around four years officially, uh, we really started this work facing a lot of barriers. And I think if we talk about barriers related to kind of Medicaid work and, and Leander did a great job sort of outlining sort of these sort of larger kind of higher level barriers, we're low level barriers to this work. Well, mistrust of government agencies, right? Like I get, I get a lot of like, well, you work for the state. Well, I mean, yeah, but like, I'm not like the state, I'm not a clipboard person, right? Um, burnout, like we ask a lot of, of hospitals and, and healthcare providers, really profound and troubling disparities. I mean, I think, you know, when I started this work three and a half years ago, I think we'd all kind of read the articles and the reports about how, um, you know, about the disparities and, and the health outcomes in Louisiana, um, bad press, um, and also not a lot of social or political capital to do health equity um, and maternal mortality and morbidity work. All of this sort of set up, right, coupled with sort of some of those barriers, you know, that um, structures like Louisiana Medicaid bases really kind of left us with uh, a problem. Like, how do we solve for equity within this problem? What's our philosophy of work? And I'm going to tell you. So next slide. How do we do equity work, right? With all of these barriers and all these structures around us. This is our philosophy. Um, our philosophy is uh, one, bake equity conversations and activities into everything you do. So every initiative that I just mentioned, equity is the first thing we build into that work, right? The, what's the equity best practice? What's the nugget? What's the work in there? And also every conversation, we try to slip a little equity bit in there, disparity reduction. Um, Next, we have to confront our own issues with equity and racism as administrators of this work. Um, we can't expect our partners to go on a journey with us if we aren't willing to confront our own history um, with bias and racism um, as actors uh, within health systems. We have to be creative about how hospitals and our partners can begin this work. It's really, really important as well. Um, not everybody can like roll in on day one with an implicit bias training. Not everybody's ready for that. Uh, so how do you start equity work in a way that um, brings people in, uh, in a, you know, meaningful ways? Um, when people uh, are pushed back and are afraid, um, we committed to doubling down, right? We never give up when somebody pushes back. Um, and lastly, there's always something you can do, right? Even if it's like a small equity thing, there's always something you can do. So that was our equity philosophy. Next slide, please. So two quick examples, right, with I said. Um, on the left, you can kind of see like, this is was our reality of working within um, when we started our I said initiative, this idea of like highly stigmatized, um, you know, substance use disorder, highly stigmatized in healthcare settings, working with implicit and explicit bias, right? The language of substance use disorder um, can be really stigmatizing. 
um, and also policies that were really imbalanced, imbalanced and stigmatizing. And so, you know, kind of how do we start the work? Well, you lean into equity, you lean into surveillance. Um, what do we know about, uh, what do we know about this? Well, we know that, why is this work important? Well, um, the leading cause of pregnancy associated but not related death in Louisiana um, is overdose. Right, that's our universal global why in Louisiana. That's why we do this work, and we know that stigma and bias are two reasons that keep people away from life-saving care. Right, that's what grounds this work. Um, we really try to name stigma and bias quickly and often as an aspect of this work. We ask our teams who do this work to set equity-based goals every time we meet. We celebrate this work when it's uncomfortable, and we start with policies and procedures. We start from the ground up, rebuild those policies move from there. Next slide. We also uh, help to build kind of quality improvement through our designations. Um, we have two of them, as I mentioned. This one's slide is more closely aligned with our safe, with our birth ready designation. Um, and equity work is a big part of that. So in order to achieve a quality improvement designation, you have to do equity work. And on the right hand side, you can see just a couple little um, of the requirements related to equity work there. Next slide. And lastly, just some final thoughts. I think as you're looking to kind of figure out like how do we become agents or like ambassadors for some of the systems change that maybe um, Medicaid or some of these larger, right, um, more powerful programs uh, like can't right they can't be as nimble as we can so what do we do right we have to find logical entry points and partners to this work it's really important to balance universal wise so like the big like why are we doing this work where's the evidence what does the surveillance say with the local why sometimes an individual provider might not care about the best practice but they do care about something and we have to find it and that's the thing we capitalize on um, and that's where we locate those common threads and we leverage shared values to bring people together to create those partnerships that allow us to, um, you know, bring those alliances. And, and when all of that fails, we really lean into the data, lean into surveillance. And sometimes we have to lean into the, the to image. And, and I'm not afraid to be the one to say, you don't want to be the only one here that's not designated, right? You don't want to be the only one in town who's not designated, that would be a bummer. Um, and I think that's that's kind of how we can be agents of change where Louisiana Medicaid may be hampered in some of their more nimble efforts. We are allowed to do some of this work um, where, where they can't. I'm really, really excited to hand this over to someone who is kind of so much cooler than I am. Uh, Kai is gonna talk to you all about work in Georgia. Well, I don't know how cool I am. And I'll also preface this by saying I am recovering from COVID. So if I have to make like a weird cough here and again, I just ask your grace. Um, thanks so much for sticking with us. Um, I'll also lift up the fact that I don't work for the Georgia Department of Community Health or Medicaid, um, but I will be giving kind of a community grounded snapshot of what we are doing here in the Peach State. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so a little bit about who I work for. Um, since 1974, Healthy Mothers, Healthy Babies Coalition of Georgia has been one of the strongest statewide voices for improved access to health care and health outcomes for Georgia's mothers, um, birthers, and babies. Um, during these unprecedented times, we really recognize just how critical it is not only to provide those direct resources and education to families, but also look at the workforce and reduce systematic barriers to ensure that every mother, birther, and child has access to resources for a healthy um, life. Um, next slide, please. So I am what I call a storyteller and a story can't um, begin without really grounding us in our why. Um, so I wanna set the stage a bit for the evolution of maternal health improvement efforts in Georgia. So um, like other uh, Southern states, Georgia um, has consistently ranked among the worst in the nation for maternal mortality and morbidity rates for birth givers. Um, I have the pleasure of serving on the Maternal Mortality Review Committee, which has been working very diligently to review the incidence of maternal mortality 
and make recommendations for strategies to improve uh, those maternal health outcomes. Today, I'm really gonna focus on the most recent data trends observed by the committee through 2017. Um, and you can see all of this information here. And because I know we're kind of strapped for time, I won't go through all of this. Um, but I will say from 2015 to 2017, the ratio for pregnancy associated deaths in Georgia averaged to 68.9 maternal deaths per 100,000, which is roughly three times higher uh, than the national average. And when we kind of examine what the causes are uh, for the pregnancy related um, deaths, they include high blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease, and obesity. The piece that always kind of grounds me and gets me motivated, um, which is both kind of a bittersweet statement, is that, you know, it was deemed that 87% of those pregnancy related and associated deaths were preventable. So, so that really means that this is a solvable problem. Next slide, please. So, when accounting for race, the disparities are even more concerning. Black women here in Georgia are roughly two and a half times more likely to die from childbirth than white women. And additionally, individuals living in rural parts of the state experience a slightly higher rate of maternal mortality than those living in urban areas. Um, there are a multitude of underlying issues which contribute uh, to these conditions, um, and, and including limited access to insurance, um, perinatal care, and social determinants of health, which were um, kind of mentioned by Amy and Leandra earlier. Um, and I told y'all I like to tell stories, and I'll promise I'll try my best not to go down too many rabbit holes here. Um, but when I was 19 years old, you know, I thought I knew everything about the world. I was a product of generational poverty, had experienced almost all of what is now called adverse childhood experience. Um, yet I did manage to go to college and pick up a part-time job. And I was in love, y'all, um, and did what lovers do. Lo and behold, pregnant um, and on Medicaid and scared out of my mind, had no idea what to do. And although it was almost 20 years ago now, I can tell you that I still feel the pain of invisibility. My entire pregnancy and through the birth of my eldest son, I felt lost, judged, unheard. And more importantly, I didn't have that feeling of joy that I thought you were supposed to when you had a baby. And like many others, I just internalized it and simply pushed it down. And although I had Medicaid, like the quality of care was to be desired, I will say. Um, when I would say I was hurting or I didn't want certain things done to my son, I was not listened to. And I had no idea what was covered and what wasn't um, when navigating that. I think this is important for a lot of reasons as we talk about these systems and how they can support. It's not just making sure that people have access by way of passing um, a policy, but also that they're aware of their benefits and how to navigate those systems. Um, you know, of course, after that incident, I didn't want to have more children. And unfortunately, I married and divorced um, my son's father. Fast forward uh, several years, and I have two other sweet boys who keep me busy in my 40s, which I am learning is something that a lot of women out here are doing. Um, but I will note that that invisibility still stuck with me when I have um, a more comfortable, um, you know, social status, if you will. Um, and it is larger um, than just stigma associated with socioeconomic statuses, um, but also those ethnic disparities. Um, so I share all that to say that, you know, yes, Black women here in Georgia are three times more likely to die from childbirth than white women, but it's not just because of income inequalities alone there has been this misconception that this is just a poor person's issue, um, but you really need to understand that a Black mother with a college education here in Georgia is about 60% greater risk for maternal death than a white women um, with less than a high school education. Next slide, please. And lastly, kind of as we ground ourselves in the why in Georgia, um, I wanna talk about those access to care barriers. 
Um, we did this comprehensive study, just understanding what access to pre prenatal care looked like here in Georgia. And 17.1% of women, despite geography, have inadequate access to prenatal care. In addition, since about 1994, there have been about 37 labor and delivery unit closures across the state of Georgia, particularly in rural counties where two thirds of births happen outside of their home county, which isn't surprising given that approximately 93 rural counties have no hospital with a labor and delivery unit. As one would assume, given these realities, those rural birth givers are experiencing, um, you know, those higher maternal mortality rates. Um, and layering again, this is further exacerbated when you account for race, where rural Black birth givers have double the maternal mortality rate than rural white women. And, and I will say, although this data certainly highlights the severity of this issue, um, there is a bright spot, um, which I will talk about um, coming uh, next. So next slide, please. Uh, so um, I, I'm pleased to say that earlier I serve on the Maternal Mortality uh, Review Committee, which after a multitude of advocacy efforts and conversations with our legislature was adopted in 2014 with the passing of HB 273. Um, and of course, like many other MMRCs, uh, the mission is to identify pregnancy associated deaths, reviews those caused by pregnancy complications and other um, selected deaths and identify problems contributing to those deaths and interventions that may reduce those deaths. Um, in 2019, in concert with the MMRC, a study committee on maternal mortality was enacted and a report of its findings was released in December um, of that year. Uh, they released a bunch of recommendations to address the disparities I mentioned earlier in my presentation. Um, and I'm going to kind of walk through some of those and also um, kind of highlight um, some of the progress we've made in those spaces. So as you can see here, theme one, patient and family. Uh, in 2017, the legislature added $100,000 to the Georgia Department of Community Health um, FY 2018 budget to assist the agency in implementing programs to address maternal um, mortality based on some of those early recommendations of the MMRC. Um, with that appropriation, um, the Department of Public Health employed three case abstractors who are responsible for requesting, collecting, and abstracting the records of birthing persons and creating a case narrative of each maternal mortality. Um, as Amy kind of alluded to earlier, data really helps ground us in this work. And now from a community lens, have an opportunity to sit and review those cases. A lot of those holes that existed before when we were kind of digging into the why behind some of those maternal deaths are illuminated further um, based off of those abstractors. Um, also, thanks to the addition of those abstractors, we were able to catch up on cases. Um, as you know, the CDC recommends that um, the cases are reviewed within two years of the date of death. And we, given this year, have um, finally caught up to that space. So really excited to share that. Uh, the next theme here is providers. So in 2018, um, the legislator legislature approved about $2 million to implement quality improvement projects in rural birthing hospitals. Um, the Department of Public Health launched the um, Georgia Perinatal Quality Collaborative, or what we like to call GAPQC, uh, which measures reduction in severe maternal morbidity uh, with a goal to engage stakeholders in implementing equitable evidence-based perinatal care through a robust data-driven quality improvement collaborative. Um, in partnership uh, with the Alliance for Innovation on Maternal Health, AIM, the GAP QC um, impacts approximately 92,000 births a year. And AIM hospitals currently represent 77% of Georgia's birthing hospitals. And 58 AIM hospitals have worked on um, the obstetric hemorrhage, um, severe hypertension, or both initiatives, each aimed um, at combating one of the leading causes of maternal deaths here in our state. And the GAPQC really leans on 
the recommendations and findings from the MMRC, which again, um, allows us to have a, a multi-system, multi-faceted view on how we approach um, maternal mortality here in the state. Um, the next theme I wanna go to is facility. Uh, in 2021, the Department of Public Health launched the Georgia Maternal Health Echo, which provides a virtual kind of learning platform for clinicians, but also community advocates um, to come together and collaborate on implementations of solutions to address maternal mortality and severe morbidity in our state. And again, I'm one of those lucky folks who get to be flies in rooms. And I will say that these have been very powerful conversations and very honest conversations, um, dispelling a lot of the myths that existed, both around you know, trust and implicit bias, but also how we can you know, build partnerships with the clinical side of, of things. Um, I also want to shout out the Morehouse Center for Maternal Health Equity, which was established in concert with recommendations and appropriations in 2020 that really is diving in to pursue equity in maternal health um, by, again, focusing on that reduction of maternal morbidity and mortality. Um, the center has begun developing um, a OBGYN rural residency program, which is the second in the country. Um, and, and they established uh, a respectful maternity care simulation project. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the next piece is systems of care. I won't touch on this too much because I'll be speaking about Medicaid on my next slide, but I will um, lift up the fact that this past legislative session, we were able um, to pass legislation that mandates um, autopsies for um, maternal deaths. And the last theme, of course, is community, where I am very comfortably grounded. And there have been a multitude of investments, um, one of which um, kind of tests different innovative solutions, or I use innovative with the asterisk, um, leveraging technology and home visitation services um, and other creative ways um, to really steep community and cultural um, relevancy in some of the solutions that we implement, both Medicaid aligned, but even outside of that ecosystem. Next slide, please. All right, so I would be remiss if I didn't really like lift up all of the amazing progress leveraging Medicaid to promote maternal health equity in our state especially this last legislative um, session. So um, as some of you may know, prior to 2021, birthers in Georgia were only able to receive pregnancy Medicaid through 60 days postpartum. And, and as you can imagine, this is troubling considering over two thirds of pregnancy associated deaths happen up to 12 months postpartum and nearly half of pregnancies um, that happen in our state are covered by um, pregnancy Medicaid. Um, thanks to collaborative advocacy efforts and the work of the MMRC and legislature, HB 114 was passed, directing Georgia's Department of Community Health to extend Medicaid um, care to six months postpartum, but that also provided coverage for lactation care and services. Um, Georgia obtained a, a 115 waiver from CVS to implement that extension, which took effect on July 1st, 2021. Now, this did occur during the public health emergency and our best friend COVID still won't leave. I don't know why. Um, so that emergency has been extended uh, through December, but still wins, right? Um, and then you move forward to this last uh, legislative session and we have now thankfully adopted um, full 12 month postpartum care um, by Medicaid with the passing of SB 338. Um, now the plan is for DCH to phase out the waiver um, while simultaneously revising the state plan to 12 months. Um, the transition plan is currently still pending with CMS, um, but we expect um, a formal approval um, to happen very soon so we can move forward. Um, I also want to talk about, you know, looking at rural health care, um, particularly for moms and birthers. Uh, the governor approved the FY 2023 budget, which includes an additional 80 
$1.5 million for physicians through improved Medicaid provider rates and the elimination of an unusual attestation requirement. Um, there has also been a tiered incentive program for certain OBGYN practices um, in rural Georgia who accept pregnancy Medicaid. Um, lastly, I wanna talk about the state's quality plan, which explores specific ways to address health equity through social determinants and ensuring birthers are getting access to critical services to assist them in navigating challenges. Um, there has been a significant intentionality on cross-sector and de departmental kind of partnerships. This allows us as community members to hold decision makers accountable and connect policy and practice solutions that are culturally responsive and relevant. Now, as Leandra shared earlier, sometimes incremental change moves more significant action revealed through our push here in Georgia to establish the MMRC, the passing of um, Medicaid postpartum from 60 days to six months, and then six months to 12 months, and so on. Um, and as we look ahead, we're working with all sectors of the community to urge our legislature to adopt an equitable Medicaid reimbursement structure not only for traditional clinicians, of course, um, they are certainly in that um, kind of bubble, but we also wanna focus on the perinatal workforce um, that includes those doulas that we talked about earlier, um, childbirth educators, um, certified breastfeeding specialists and um, peer support specialists and others. Um, specifically, HMHBGA is working directly with um, care managed organizations to pilot a Medicaid reimbursement um, structure here in Georgia for doula care. And we're leaning on intelligence from states across the country who have adopted similar reimbursement structures earlier um, and have been working with the National Health Law Center to make sure that we're approaching this in a comprehensive way and also learning from the lessons of others. Um, and lastly, I'll say we're pushing for awareness building overall. Um, Medicaid benefits, eligibility, particularly in communities that have historically lost trust in the system. This means more than just an email or a random text from um, a CMO, right? It's about implementing strategies ground in the unique needs of the communities, which some of these communities don't even have access um, to broadband services and or they're like me who get like thousands of emails a day and don't open them and, and miss out on critical information. Next slide, please. So really quickly, um, you'll be getting copies of these slides. Um, I just wanted to put two resources here that I think would be helpful for you to explore if you wanna learn more about um, just what's going on here in Georgia. Um, and there will also be a handout that kind of chronicles um, the progress um, around maternal health equity here in our state. Next slide, please. And lastly, I always like to have um, a sharing from the folks who we support. Um, so if you'll indulge, indulge me, it's just a one minute um, conversation that I wanna leave you with today. If you can play the video. For me, a black woman in America about to give birth to her first child, this fight is especially paramount. I am terrifyingly aware of the fact that regardless of my socioeconomic status, income level, education level, et cetera, that I am just as close to becoming a maternal mortality statistic as any other Black woman in this country, let alone the state of Georgia, with the deciding factor being the color of my skin. This should not be the case. and there is much more work to be done. Yet I am truly encouraged by how far we've come and the strides that we're making now. A lot of truths in maternal health have been exposed due to COVID and more and more community members, volunteers, organizations, businesses, and advocates are joining to support this crucial cause. This mounting support is what will make change happen sooner rather than later. 
Thank you. I'll pass it back to, I think, Leandra for questions. Perfect. Thank you so much, Kai, and to Amy. Let me see if I can just go to this last slide with our contact info. Um, so I know we are short on time. We have a few minutes for questions, but um, if we don't get around to yours, here's our contact info. Feel free to reach out. I did answer a question in the Q&A about where to sign up to receive the report that will be released in September. So hopefully you'll take advantage of that. Um, and if you want to contact Amy or Kai directly, feel free to do so. So let me see here. I'm actually going to stop sharing my screen too. Awesome. So I can better see everything. Um, let's see. So the slides um, as well, I saw a question about the slides being available. Um, I will send that over to the symposium host so that can be available for you um, as well to look at afterward. Um, let's see. Any other questions? I don't see any in the Q&A or the chat, so I'll actually pose one for you, Kai and Amy. Um, I know, Amy, in your pr presentation in particular, you talked about partnerships even outside of Medicaid, and I know that was a, a huge finding from the report. So we'd love to hear, like, what would be your, you know, one or two pieces of advice for programs that want to partner with other folks? Um, and Kai, you're welcome to jump in as well, but um, Amy, I'll hand it off to you first for any kind of advice you'd want to share. That's such a good question. You know, particularly, and I, this is, I've been working in state government, you know, you're like, you're like, oh, everybody's got a little silo, but the same thing happens with community partnerships. And I, you know, I'm sure Kai can, when you're working community organizations or community organizing, you're like, are we just seeing the same 12 people at the same meeting, like over and over and over again? So my one piece of advice would be to really challenge yourself to not only look outside your silo, but really look to see, like pull little tiny threads, right? invite people who are tangentially related, who may not be, a really good example is with our ISET initiative is, you know, you normally wouldn't think of like a quality improvement initiative focused on perinatal care, um, inviting the Department of Corrections to the table to try to en encourage partnership like right off the bat. And that's a, a, one of the places where we started. And it's just sort of like that is be creative about those partners. Um, because they will challenge you and they will make you think outside the box and they will ask you wonderful, interesting questions. Um, and it's nice to, to see new faces um, and, and to have those new partnerships and to really widen and expand, to really break down your walls in really significant and dramatic and wonderful ways. Kai? Yeah, I, I mean, I'd echo that sentiment. Um, and also, you know, I'm in a unique space because a lot of organizations um, and like governmental agencies approach us to represent community, right? And I always, come, but you know, respond, I am but one narrow um, kind of lane for community. Um, and I am not a Medicaid recipient and I encourage you to actually talk to the people who you aspire to support. And don't expect them to show up in the way that you feel they should, um, you know, and, and allow them equal kind of placement at the table and not just say, I have this shiny thing. What do you think about it? But say, I have observed these are challenges that you're navigating in the community. How can we work together um, to lift up one another. And that's a different context, right? I don't want to just tell you about your widget that probably won't do anything for me. I appreciate all of the different innovations and apps that exist right now, but I've had a Fitbit for, I don't know, five years, and I am still not even close to my weight loss goals, right? So I just think that we need to be very practical in the way in which we navigate these conversations. Mm -hmm. Um, there are like tons of questions coming up in the yeah. chat that I wish we had time to explore around like innovations. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have tons of information around PM3 and pickles and ice cream, and I'm sure Amy also has information that she'd like to share. So I think we can kind of maybe get those questions and respond to them accordingly. 
um, yeah. via email. Yeah, yeah, maybe I can either, um, I also kind of gather the responses for from you both and mm -hmm. then add them with the slides um, for folks afterward. That, that may be a good way for folks. Um, but yeah, I know we're so short on time, but I really wanna thank uh, Kai and Amy once again. Mm -hmm.